Thank you for tuning in to Androna Talks Radio. Gathering as one in our sovereign truth from a galactic perspective. Exploring our world with new ideas, knowledge and a promise of a better future. Galactic discussions for collective minded people. Androna Talks. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on Andrana Talks Radio. And we have Derek and Daniel back with us again. This will be, I believe it's the fourth show that we've done already. And we have an archive of a bunch of different shows. We we were planning on going through the book faster, but there's so much content here. It's definitely worth spending some time and grazing through it and, and picking up all those little key points. Because um, clearly, uh, Daniel Salter left uh, a legacy of information some of the information people have read about from different sources but he kind of put everything together from his own experiences and also associations that he had so uh, without further delay i'd like to welcome in uh hello daniel thanks for joining us and derek yes hi good to see hi. you hi yeah. So we're back again talking about your grandfather and uh, I know it's a, a good subject for you because you know there's a lot of love and you you know you have your heart invested in it as well as I know that you're very proud of him and what he was able to do and he survived a lot of what others weren't able to survive so that also is a statement alone um, but the subjects in the book are a little bit, um, how can I say, they're heated subjects, even still today, even though people think, well, it happened 40, 50 years ago. Uh, some of these subjects are still in question, and also the full disclosure never fully happened. They're trying to right now, but uh, oh, it's breaking through a little bit. I'll be positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're heading in the right direction, I think, still. So this is good. Yeah, do you, if you have any like thoughts you guys want to share, and and before we get get into, we're going to go into oh, is it chapter ten and eleven, and um, you know whenever you guys, if you want to share anything else, you let me know, or just go for it. I just wanted to say for the people who maybe didn't catch um, the previous episode when we talked about our grandfather's book, it's Life with the Cosmos Clearance, um, and he wrote it back in two thousand three. Uh, with a lot of disclosure information. Um, he was one of the witnesses at the original disclosure project in 2001, um, and he was in the, the Air Force and the NRO um, with um, a cosmic uh, clearance. So he had, he had a lot of information on UFOs and extraterrestrials. So just a little background as before we dive into the chapters we're going to talk about here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing that in, because obviously I'm going to have all the the different shows connected but yes it's good to have that review and we will uh, display the book as well so yeah. um anything else I, I was gonna say just i've always felt this way i don't want people to just think that you know our granddad wrote the book in, almost back in 2001 or 2003 and that we were just like fully on board and just believed everything he said like that's not the case it took a lot of us trying to use our own discernment and, and really figure things out because when you read the book it it's kind of goes all over the place it goes into a lot of you know controversial subjects and things that sound way out there but i, I tell you what the the last few years has really given more confirmation or validation behind what he was saying and the fact that so much more has come to light and and come to the surface that ties in a lot with what he was saying. So I can only say the evidence starts to build up more and more as we go. And it's interesting to note this this new whistleblower that everybody's talking about, this David Grush, it says he's from the NRO. And, you know, 
that puts even more credibility that our grandfather was the first to say this as a true whistleblower saying he was a part of that program and that all the intel is kind of funneled to that group and that he's at least internally trying to investigate that and whether you want to believe completely uh, the grush story and and his his motives i i would always be very skeptical about anybody that comes and gives an official you know a report in the mainstream media that's allowed to do that within the mainstream media without pushback where others have struggled so much to get information out but why why is he now the fr the front the face that we're all looking at so everybody just use your use your critical thinking and and don't yeah always always use it with a grain of salt with what you what you hear from anything <laughs> official so so uh, you know quote unquote official i would just say that to start with yeah 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 thanks I, I, and i think it's interesting that this is the um david grush he's the first um person from the nr that i've heard of that's come out besides our grandfather who was associated with that organization and the, um you know disclosed that publicly so there's also Stephen Greer. Yes. You, uh, your grandfather worked with Stephen Greer too, didn't he? Or am, am, am I incorrect? Oh, he did. Yeah, on the on the first disclosure project. But I was for, for that to be associated with the actual National Reconnaissance Office. Um, our grandfather was the first person I'm aware of that came forward from that organization in this disclosure movement. And it, it is, um, Gresh is the second one that I've I've, I've seen. So we could start with uh, chapter 10, and this is going to be addressing this, the secret deep underground military bases. And so, um, you know, whoever wants to start sharing of what they remember and, and uh, you know, any side notes or anything regarding, because remember that the public is not, you know, necessarily reading the book. Um, some of them have actually, quite a few have told me they purchased the book. And they wanted to read it. And so I, I I told everyone, you know, it's kind of like a a bit of a textbook for, you know, what has been going on in disclosure uh, for many years. And he kind of sums a lot of the key points up in this one book. And it's, you know, it's a good reference point. So, um, yeah. yeah, so we're going to talk about the deep uh, underground military bases. So you t whoever wants to start. Yeah, I'll start because I remember, uh, I mean, this is a lot to do with Phil Schneider's testimony. And our grandfather says that he was good friends with Phil Schneider. And, you know, we don't, I don't know if we have a lot to to know just, you know, what their connection was. But I do remember, and I always bring it back to when I was uh, still in high school, and I was visiting my grandfather in Taos at his house, and he would bring a lot of interesting people, like-minded people that were into kind of these topics that, you know, not a lot of people would talk about this stuff and you'd have to find your circle of, <laughs> of people that you know, could even trust to want to share this information. So he had people over and I remember him, had a VH, he had a VHS tape of this Bill Snyder uh, testimony of one of the recent talks he must have just done back then or in the mid 90s. And so it was just an old VHS tip, and I remember watching that. And it, that's the first I ever heard of anything like this. But at least, you know, I was, that, I think that was one of the, the main eye opening things for me to see somebody talking about this stuff at that early age before our grandfather wrote this book or anything. But that was a big part of disclosure and what, what really kind of opened my eyes to be like, well, is that, is that possible that we have these deep underground facilities? That have been, you know, being constructed and and dug out by these engineers like Phil Schneider since, you know, since the 40s. I mean, he has some interesting facts that he put together, you know, based on the black budget program and the amount of funding that it takes and, and the amount of technology that advanced technology for boring out these things. I think he said something like they can bore about seven miles within about two days or something or or within a couple seven miles within I, I don't want to get it wrong but it was like within a within a day or something like that some crazy number and uh and then he said that this underground cities are typically about two two and a half to four square miles in size 
So try to picture that <laughs> as uh, and that these facilities exist. There's a bunch of these underground bases, at least 129 of them. Um, there's a sub global network that runs on maglev systems that runs like Mach 2 for these like a subway system that people can imagine that he says that they're every state they're connected to every single state and connected across the world and it even goes under the ocean so to have the ability to do that yeah you got to really wrap your mind around that because that takes a lot more sophistication than what we're, we're being taught uh, and being told so i don't know that's just one way to start in my first recollection of phil, phil schneider's talk and oh one thing that's important to note now, they said they would talk to each other in D.C. That's what he says in, in that chapter later on. And they would exchange information and what one knew, the other one didn't know and vice versa. But I think it was clear that Phil Snyder knew he was going to. We can kind of talk about that story that he he basically had an interaction with the aliens uh, as they were trying to build out one of these bases. And he got hit with a laser, some ray gun or something that gave him radiation and cancer over the years. And so he was never, he was terminally ill and he knew he was gonna die soon enough. So that's why I think he felt open to just keep talking and talking until he couldn't, couldn't talk anymore, whether they got rid of him or not. Um, and so he, he wouldn't stop. So the fact that he was that bold to do that and not care for the consequences, it shows kind of one aspect of disclosure of somebody willing to do that and then our grandfather who maybe is more careful that wants to rele release information in a way that he's protected and even after talking to dr sala we recently did an uh, interview with him but mentioning that all of the documents that our grandfather uses are public record basically anybody can access them so that was a way of our grandfather protecting himself from uh you know other others coming in and trying to to say, you know, shut up, you can't say that. But at least it's, it, he's saying, you know, if you want to go do your own homework, you can find this information out. And so that was one thing, maybe to give him credibility as well, but also to protect him. But in Phil Snyder's case, he knew his days were numbered. So he really, he was trying to get out as much as possible, as quick as possible, so. Yeah, Phil, Phil Schneider and our grandfather had very similar clearances. They were pretty much at the same level. So they they knew a, a lot of the same information, um, but our grandfather again expressed, you know, the only difference was he knew he was going to die, so he he was you know very rapidly aggressively coming out and giving lectures on this stuff and presenting it to the public, where our grandfather wasn't able to do that um, for fear of his life, you know. Yeah. And yeah, Phil, Phil Schneider was warned several times about um, you know disclosing this information, and ultimately he was he was killed. It wasn't the cancer isn't what killed him it was uh it was whoever didn't want that information out uh, that ended up doing it so officially and this was all in the early, early 90s yeah yeah right. officially it was a suicide but we all know they, they showed markings of strangulation and all this stuff that there's no way it was a suicide so yeah your grandfather states that in the book he, mm -hmm. he says that that's what they found and um i i also remember listening to uh phil schneider's testimony years ago and to me, it was very credible. But, you know, your grandfather was actually helping them to construct these underground bases. He was there. So it makes sense that, right? Is, isn't that correct? That's what he says in the book. Yeah, he, he said or he, he, saw the, on, he saw the, um, he knew they were real. He, he went to one of the bases in Bataan in, in the Philippines. Um, he mentions that uh, he was amazed. You know, there was hospitals, you know, big headquarters with entire staffs, weapons areas. Um, just it was just a massive place. Um, so he kind of describes yeah, he, that was his experience to confirm that they really did exist. But he needed they they needed some of his expertise in certain things. That's what kind of linked him to some of these projects. So that was I think that's part of the Phil Snyder testimony. So it's hard to, uh, people for people reading the book. It's going to be hard for you to see this, but there's a lot of times he's quoting or he's putting in information from like in the next chapter, it's from Lord Desmond Leslie, I guess. But a lot of it's actually like uh, the article or the lecture. So that was Phil's part of Phil Schneider's lecture. Um, yeah, Phil Schneider was he was helping to dig these bases. He would use explosives expert and, mm -hmm. you know, getting down to the, the different levels and, and 
helping to create them. That's how he knew it was aware of all the technology. And at the time, he didn't realize it was tied what he, to what he called the New World Order. And he didn't find out till later. He was lied to the whole time. Um, but yeah, our grandfather did did say that he was at one of the bases in the Philippines. So he, that was his uh, confirmation for him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he had a level of expertise that linked him to some of these people, whatever that level was, that, that they needed him. And so he was in the know, as they say. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and it gets it gets pretty interesting because <clears throat> Phil Schneider is a hero to a lot of people in a sense that you know he he was bold enough to come out and talk about it. Um, also, that he was pretty fearless too. He he went down there with a weapon. He apparently startled the ETs, and then they shot at him. He shot at them. So uh, I don't know man, how many he ended up taking down but he you know they almost took they i guess took him down to radiation exposure and i've told people for years that i've had radiation exposure from et's they automatically have that kind of energy and that was the only way that i could you know i validated that with peter as well but i knew it i knew that something had happened and that i was getting exposed because they were constantly um coming around me and they just naturally have that field that kind of energy around them, which is is one of the reasons why it's hard for our societies to naturally converge. There would have to be some kind of isolation or protection or people would get very sick and it would kill off a lot of people. So there's, there's that other component because I know that there's a constant um, discussion about why is it that they were not, um, dis- why is it that all of this information isn't disclosed. And I know that there are other agendas, of course, you know, they could uh, back engineer and they, they talk about, your, your grandfather talks about that as well. They can back engineer, they can do all sorts of things without other nations even knowing how advanced they are, right? Yeah. So they kept a lot of things undercover. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, yeah. I was looking at the um, George uh, um, Phil Schneider's account. Yeah, he said he um, he shot two of them. They were large grays that he encountered, and it was like total total surprise. And um, one of the, he got a uh, hole blown him blown in him, and it was a uh, cobalt radiation. Uh, um, and I've actually seen pictures online of him that I guess he that um, where he, that he showed the scars from. I guess when he was doing lectures, he yeah. um, where he ha- had that. Uh, the wound but yeah our, our grandfather talks a lot about um you know the network of these underground bases it's worldwide i mean they go under the ocean they're they're, they're everywhere so um and, and certainly it's it's covered up uh, by governments around the world but in this chapter it's interesting he does talk about um this report that uh, this french group did um with some alien disclosure type information and this was back in the 90s um and also the belgian government coming forward with with some disclosure so there are some governments out there besides the us that have in the past put things out there and you know on a worldwide level why it's been overlooked is i think primarily from the us side of it just to keep this under wraps so that yeah. they don't i mean they don't learn about you know, free technology basically it's all about free technology and saving the oil industry and you know all the the money motivation for 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 that um so we don't know where it's going to go but yeah if we can talk about some of the um rest of this chapter talking about um what was disclosed from these uh different things back then um derek did you uh you have to speed on some of that sure yeah that's fine um i was just reading through it again but uh what was I going to say? I was going to say, yeah, US, the U.S. government and the U.S. in general is kind of the gatekeeper to all this information because, of course, they're the ones spending the trillions of dollars, literally trillions of dollars, as Bill Snyder was saying, even back when he he was talking about this stuff. And the black budget's at least 25 percent of the actual budget of the gross product or whatever that that's being used and, and people yeah, people have to look at those numbers because they wonder how this is possible. But when you have these corporations and 
and the backing that it does uh, to build all this stuff out. And if it's been happening since the 40s, he said the technology goes up about 40, 44 years every two years, um, just about. So imagine if they've been doing that since the 50s, how much more advanced they are truly in these black projects, what technology they have. But he goes on, our grandfather goes on to talk about the other types of craft, one being the Black Manta, and the Black Manta yep. is the USA's, USA's uh, tri equilateral triangle craft. And so I think I'm, I think that uh, I, whether this was like the, the big, big version of that or whether these TR3 sh types of ships are like uh, these, these other versions of the Black Manta, maybe there's some smaller ones like that and the Black Manta is maybe a larger size, but he mentions that the U.S. has been doing demonstrations to show at least uh, covertly show other countries that we have this capability that we're not afraid of, say, Korea and any nuclear attack or anything because we could easily use this technology to to com to combat that or, or fight uh, against that. But he mentioned two major sightings. One was the Phoenix Lights that we mm -hmm. all know of. Yeah. So, so it's interesting because our grandfather will say kind of these things like a matter of fact, like he knows <laughs> and, and, and personally he knows from his own his own clearances. So he's kind of just saying, yeah, so that the Phoenix Lights is one case where we're showing off the black man's capability. And there was another famous one. I can't, I'm just trying to remember where that was. I don't know if you guys saw that. Oh, Phoenix, yeah, here. And the, uh, the other one was, Actually, the I guess the one for government was involved in demonstrating it to the Belgian government, the Phoenix Lights. Oh, and the salt uh, Gulf Breeze, Florida, the one that was. There was famous. a bunch of them. Yeah, there was. Um, I think I underlined there was like a a bunch of locations. Oh, oh those are the underground facilities that that. Yes, yeah. that I mean, there's there's so many incidences and there. And then there's uh, the Bill and um, Betty and Barney Hill incident that happened over here where there was an abduction, which kind of, you know, kind of I put it uh, put it on the map. But, you know, we've had UFO sightings. There's documentations that I remember listening to uh, Stanford Friedman and he would discuss, um, you know, his historically all these different articles where people were identifying flying objects and that definitely whether they were already uh, reverse engin engineered back then or whether that they were extraterrestrial in nature that has been going on for quite some time and so they've been documenting this quite you know fervently and so yep. you're seeing this also in your in the book where he's talking about and then the frustration of not being able to um, have the public acknowledge for what they're seeing I mean the Phoenix light was one of them it was almost like you know it's a mockery that yeah. you know you're you're challenging people's intelligence and i think the in the book uh they reference uh that there was they went to court over it because the people felt you know you're you're insulting us you're telling us that we're not seeing what we're seeing um you're you're imp implying that maybe there's something wrong with us or what what have you that that happens in these incidences which makes people step back and not alarm the rest of the public in the event that something does really happen, it's quite dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it's uh, he, he talks about uh, you know the other other governments criticizing the U.S. and saying you know that it, they're they're repressing so much and it's it's I, I mean I guess there's nothing they can do about it, but it's uh, very apparent that in the the, the French study that um, the report that I was mentioning earlier, they said they where they had a group of scientists and government officials and everything. This is a very official um, investigation. And then they looked at 500 different um, aeronautical sightings and they narrowed it down that 5% of the sightings were, um, there was no way that they could be attributed to anything that was from, from this planet. And so that's like 25 encounters that were clearly no explanation and that their government is, like coming out like saying this you know um and and the the u.s still denies it um and then there was another example he had for um in belgium he said there was uh 
with their military. There, there was a sighting that went on for over an hour, and they had yeah. two F-16s armed with missiles, um, and but they were unable to keep up with the UFO. They said with, with, in one minute, the craft not only was able to accelerate from 200 to 2,000 meters per second, but it simultaneously changed altitude from 3,000 to 1,700 meters. And they have it all on radar. They, I mean, they have multiple radar towers that picked this up and confirming that this was going on. And, and the Belgian government was, you know, documenting this publicly for people to see. But in, in the U.S., um, it's just uh, you just get this disinformation, this this narrative, this story that um, there's nothing to see here. You know, there's a, a bunch of pilots, too, that have, you know, eyewitness many different things, many anomalies in the sky. And they're threatened, uh, even military. They're threatened if they speak out and talk anything about it, that they could be in danger. And so, you know, there's a lot of intimidation around this. It's a type of bullying. So you say it's the government. And the government has this depth in government. So there's also these other corporations and the private interest groups and so forth, you know, that that are also involved. And... Um, another thing that they bring up, which is something that can put us a little bit on the radar, is, is the discussion of how um, when they started these wars, like in Vietnam and so forth, and how they, they were actually bringing over drugs that was, um, you know, supplying the, the funds for the black, ob uh, the black projects that they were discussing. Oh, yeah. So, That's, I mean, it's a, you know, he uh, talks about that and how it was, you know, horrible for... Uh, a military person to come back, you know, in a body bag and, and essentially have those drugs, in, you know, connected to them inside of them, however that they did it. That's an important point because that I, I had to, I didn't catch that the first time I read the book. I just, I, there's so many things I missed, but that part, he kind of said that's when him and both Bill Schneider really kind of just completely lost it with having any trust in the government and any, you know, hope that just letting them continue to do what they do. But seeing that happen in Vietnam and probably every war since where thousands of troops are being sent back in body bags and who knows what's being, you know, trafficked along with with that uh, is is pretty it's pretty sad. It's really sad. And, and it's got to be disheartening for for your, you know, all the other veterans that have it's Coming disgraceful, on. yeah, and it's that's the dark underbelly of the government that obviously they don't want people to know about, and and then it gets a little sketchy, you know, because then you have to uh, just to even talk about these subjects. It it you know they're not worried about all of these other things, but this is one of the the key areas where there's money involved, and it contributes to um, extra money that they have to play around for different things. And I was recently talking with uh, someone from the ACIO or works with the ACIO in the Unit 374, and we talked about the movie Who Cloned Tyrone, which is very soft disclosure, but it's, it's more than that. They literally have an underground base. I feel like it's related to what we're discussing right now. So it's an underground base, mm -hmm. and but it's not necessarily, you're not quite sure if it's military or not. It seems like just a group of people. But then also they have abilities. So you don't know if they're hybrids, they're ETs, or what What are they? Are these, that's what corporations are. These corporations that we talk about in the ACIO, they're actually enhanced. They're, they're maybe not originally from this planet. And they have, you know, a lot of different abilities and time travel and so forth. And they can do multiple things. But we are their experiment. And so finding them, we, you talk about like, out west where there's all these underground facilities and well-known areas you know whether it's uh, area 51 or or um you know los alamos or you know any, any of those or dulce or something like that so everything's underground but there's they brought in this other level where you have these facilities underneath the cities yeah. and focused on the poor and keeping the cities in in that kind of um, environment and, and they're so run down. Yeah, there's so yeah, yeah. those. I I grew up around Boston. I knew I knew exactly what they were talking about. And even some locations in Cambridge, which was like right around Harvard, where the university is, that were very very worn down. And you'd see people just walking around like they're in a daze. Yeah. And 
um, as a kid, you know, I was always like, all right, maybe I should, you know, be like you learn really young, you know, to navigate around those areas to not, you know, and you have them in Pennsylvania as well. So yeah, and we, I, it was it was dancing around us essentially. I was really close to MIT and um, in Harvard University. So, and all these people are coming out of these. Some of these scientists that are involved with a lot of these things are coming right from that hub. Yeah, that, I remember that. I think you were recently talking about, or I've heard about the Montauk project and the fact that <clears throat> they would grab a bunch of the homeless, a bunch of that same type of thing, just to just start experimenting on those those people and i mean tell, tell, i'm sure thousands of people at some point were just being used for these programs like that yeah and he talked about that i mean i'm quite a bit older than you guys but when he talked about that i remember i because i grew up in massachusetts so i remember them saying there was a bunch of homeless people we don't have the homeless um problem as much and I remember a couple of us talking like, well, where did they all go? Mm. Well, hopefully they brought them to a good place, but we were, we didn't believe it. You know, we knew something happened and it got a little like, and then it was kind of brushed under the rug. And then, yeah, I don't know if there's some kind of mind wiping that happens, but when he mentioned that, I was like, oh yeah. I think I remember having a discussion with someone about that because I don't know I've, if you've been, I imagine you've been in New York City, but I've walked around New York City as well. And on every street, there's people that, you know, they look like they're homeless or just laying on the street or, you know, what have you. And then just imagine, then all of a sudden they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it happens all the time. And I'm sure it's, uh, you know, there's networks underground. I'm sure they're um, a big part of the, the human trafficking efforts, you know, f with people disappearing all the time. Um, yeah, it's some pretty nasty stuff for sure. Also, Las Vegas too. There's supposed to be a whole city underneath Las Vegas. Yeah, I don't know. I've heard about that where people they come out, they 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 live underground and then they work in the casinos and do different things and then they disappear again. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I can imagine. So the world's got very strange. But there's a, you think about it, it's a whole other society. So there's a whole other America underground according to what you're saying so and, and this was years ago think about how fast that they're progressing as well as not just technology per se but say they're the uh the mechanical process of digging things out like um, musk had that boring company right where he was just digging out his whole you know little little underground city you know his escape probably because everyone is really worried about well, the elite know that mm. something's supposed to play out here and right. they're all locked in and they're underground. And some people say even Putin, Peter said Putin's already, him and the Russian elite are already underground. So th these are clones wow. that are here. Above. Um, he says that about Korea, North Korea, the, the leadership, everyone above ground is, is a prisoner. Oh. The, the, the real yes. citizens are in, in, you know, below ground. Wow. That's really weird. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we could see that. Uh, we we talked to Tony Rodriguez. It just reminds me of that, his testimony and just the slave labor that's not only that we use on our own on our own planet, but it's 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 in, intergalactic the how you know human resources are used. Or at least you know, and even our DNA, just our DNA is some of the most vital uh resources, right? And then they can go and clone and do all sorts of things. <laughs> it, it, yeah, if if we're if people look back at, uh, you know, the, our grandpa doesn't go too deep into this part, but I mean, he says we come from other races, of course. But if our DNA is so important because we have such a mix, a hybridization already, and that's how we evolved. I mean, essentially, I'm reading other books that explain that quite well. That you know, there's. It's not just obviously a simple we we came from apes <laughs> and if we did, I, I think it would take a lot more of a long, a long, long time to get to where we are yeah. now. And there's just so many variations in, in, of human beings and distinctions and there's got to be something else going on here. So uh, but yeah, if, that, if we're that truly that valuable, then yeah, of course, we'd be used. One well, way yeah. we 
as you are now. Yeah. Yeah, and I th I think the the enhancements that they've been doing over the years, you know, through generations, we've had uh, all levels of exposure. And Peter talked about how over in around the Chernobyl area, that was intentional, uh, not maybe by the government, but by others that were in power. That you know, like I said, there's the government, there's the face of the government, and then there's many other levels and corporations and so forth. And even ET races that are involved with the governments, they look like they're human and no one would even know. So they're, they um, apparently constructed this whole Chernobyl event to see who had the genetics to be resilient. And there are people that are still thriving and doing well over there. It did not affect them at all. Wow. And so then they'll take that blood type and then they'll, you know, reintegrate it into something else so that they're creating you know, a race of um, resilience. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why I, I think even like the chemical exposure and everything, some could say it's meant to wipe us out. And but on the other spectrum, those that thrive or survive have certain types of genetics of blood or whatever that enables them to do so. So um, and, and but this is the problem. I mean, we're looked at in that manner. We're looked at um, from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. And we are their uh, lab mice for right. some of them, which is scary. It's, you know. And so I guess the, the other thing to tie in, I was going to just say, and to look at the, the underground basis part, when you say there's alternative one, two, and three, right? And I think as an alternative two, if I'm not mistaken, is 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 the civilizations of us going underground and, and letting the rest of the world be blown up. And alternative three is that we actually do get off planet and we, we make it out that way. Um, just from what I just from what I remember off the top of my head. So, yeah, this if if the alternative two is really something that they were looking at, I mean, you can imagine how much resources they put into that. And and, and with Phil Snyder's testimony, it, <laughs> it, it's amazing because this also comes goes back. It's the ties to the next chapter actually go into um more on like the the vimanas and the ancient vedic scripts about them having this technology but phil schneider's dad apparently was a captured german who then started working for us and and started working for the us and um he became he was he's more or less a patriot because he was trying to to give us technology that he had and 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 he was involved in stuff like the Philadelphia experiment, the H bomb, the A bomb. That was all what uh, Phil Snyder was saying about his dad. And, and then he kind of brushed it off, like, "Well, enough about my dad." But that just happens to be who he is. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, but that's a very. Well, he said that they story. feared him, right? Or they they wanted to destroy him or kill him in Germany, and he came over here, and then he had to what change his identity or um, yeah. do something to be able to. So, and he it sounds like he survived it and. Was yeah. kind of like you know a tough guy and was exactly. able to get her smart enough to get around everything. I don't know what he did over there. Uh, like you said, maybe his involvement. It's almost like it's it's um you look at Oppenheimer. To some people, he's a genius. To other people, they they would just want to destroy him for what he did. You know, right. and so it's it kind of brings these mixed feelings of people that are involved with the projects that they were witnesses to it. And I'm sure even like Albilic went through that and, you know, because he was a part of it. And and then there's this anger around, you know, what some of the guys did around Montauk, you mm -hmm. know, even though they were disclosing it. But then there was other activities there that that were questionable and if not extremely offensive, you know, so. Right. It's it's, gonna... it's tough. It's a fine line, you know, to just to talk about it because it, you're trying to pr provide the information, but at the same time, it triggers people. Yeah, and, and I don't think there's a, it's not an accident that Oppenheimer is coming out right now and getting people interested in this topic. There's gotta be a reason. I might not know exactly what for, but there's a reason why they're putting this information, getting people uh, get used to the idea, or, it's, or get, know that that was a part of history, whether they, you know, want to tell the, the true story or whatever, but they're trying to let people know this is what happened. Um, could we be on the brink of doing it again? And maybe that's one of the reasons they're showing us this, that we really haven't evolved much since that time. And we're still on the brink of probably destroying ourselves, whether it's with nuclear or some other device. 
Um, but the mixed feelings, like you said, there was a lot of political stuff in that movie too, which was interesting. But I was going to say, it all ties, when we're talking about those projects and the Philadelphia Experiment, um, um, for one, just think of, I'll just say this before I say the other point, but the Manhattan Project, if it was as secret as it was, maybe they're getting people used to getting the idea that, well, they could build a whole town of scientists and their families and pretty much keep it secret for the most part. Nobody knew about it, building this incredible technology. And so people are like, well, we can't keep secrets. Well, the Manhattan Project proves that we can on one level, but that's just one tip of the iceberg of what we could do. If that's, you know, if we were able to do that, think of what else we've been able to do. Um, so I was just going to mention that. But also it's interesting, the, man, the Philadelphia experiment also around the same time ties into Montauk very well. And I don't know if people know that full story of how the, the time travel that happened between the ships, kind of the teleportation aspect of it. And Al Bielik, who you mentioned, was supposedly one that survived the actual experiment when almost all the others were deformed and had radiation and eventually just were so mis discombobulated afterwards, even physically dismantled in a lot of ways. But he survived that event. He, ex he goes on to a whole story. I think there's a lot of truth to what he said and the time travel aspect of it. But then he, there, there's a science behind it because there's a reason they were trying in 1943 to get that done at a specific time. And it was the summer of 43, um, July timeframe. And Nikol Tesla was part of the project. This is kind of some, some uh, I forget where I heard this, but I read a book about it. I think even Joseph Farrell wrote extensively about this topic and that's where I got the information. But he uh, said that Tesla was also advising on it. Einstein was even advising on. But they said, we're not ready. This is not going to work, guys. Like, you don't do it. Like, but they were like, no, no, we have to do it. This is the time. So there's something about the, the space-time continuum or whatever within our planetary grid that said, this is, this is the ideal time to try to, to do this experiment because it had to do ultimately whether most people knew it about on time travel or something like that. Um, but anyway, the Montauk also, what that was about 40 years later, 1983, when that kind of really took off, I guess. And, and at least in the, the uh, so one story is that they, that uh, they had a way to come back, like uh, whoever transferred to the other time, they transferred to 1983 because that was the other opening in time. And so this time loop thing sort of happened between the two periods. And so that was the time where Al Bielik, maybe not him, but James Cameron, one of them was trying to get back to the original 43 time frame. So anyway, there's all this interplay with the time. Uh, uh, Duncan Cameron. Duncan Cameron, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And so that's interesting, but I just thought that was neat to see the, 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 those intervals of time play out. Because I was born in 1983, so if you think about those years and gaps, we're here in 2023. So this would be that other pivotal time in in history, where maybe there's there's some other forces in play, where you know you might have this opening, uh, where this you know these effects could take place, or some pivotal point or type of event could could happen. And also interesting to note the prediction of the HCIO document that we just went over predicted 2023 as a pivotal time when the internet would now be sort of the the um, the point for uh, basically integration the sovereign integral it was like kind of the way that we would as a as a as a humanity start to be able to, to actually um i don't know <laughs> what, what was it dan kind of was uh connecting with other other galaxies and being our our the internet would you know it integrated the whole earth together now as, as one we can our social consciousness can be um uploaded to the, the galactic network and and be interactive and that was from the the wingmaker uh, optical disc um decoding that that we that that was also in our grandfather's book um and it's interesting when we did that we did that episode recently uh, about the wingmakers a really brief segment about um some of the some of their uh, background on our YouTube channel. One of the comments I saw the other day was someone saying about uh, Al Bielek was his name from the Philadelphia Experiment yeah. that he actually went into the future like 
800 years from now or something like that and and was with the wing makers and then came back and it, it was i had never heard that before so i'm not sure where the information came from but i, th I found that very interesting and it all kinds of kind of ties together with what we were discussing i've heard that before too and i, I think there's there's this this whole thing about peter just talked about it and how um they were doing time shifts and you know it's for 2012 because it's supposed to be the end of the world but then they shifted it again and then it ended up in 2022 23 so then they, they got shifted again to to 2032 right so right. so this this is the whole thing there they keep shifting our time but um regarding the galactic internet peter's been going to all these different realities he's probably involved i'm pretty sure he's involved in that in right. connecting us because people have said to me multiple times if he's in another reality how is he communicating with you and i said but he has been yeah. And I've, I've been working with him for, you know, it's probably seven years, eight years now, going on eight years. And, you know, just communicating. And he's been in some really weird places. And he'll get through. And there's times that we've had some problems. Like he's mm -hmm. had to use different kinds of um, equipment when we're talking. But And then he'll tell me when he can and cannot do a show. I have to do, sometimes I have to do a certain process to call into him, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, he's been involved with, uh, I'm pretty sure he's involved with that. I wouldn't be surprised. I could ask him and get a confirmation on it. But, yeah, he's he recently talked about Montauk and uh, the effects of of that, uh, those anomalies. Cause it, it creates ripples of anomalies. So right. even if they sh shift the time, then that energy has to go somewhere. It goes in and it can move through the earth. It can, you know, ch have that, like, um, you know, butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. in in a place where you least expect it so it's it's a very very powerful thing and you were talking about i just want to swing back um to what you said earlier which i thought was interesting of the different options that we can go underground we can stay above ground and we'll, you know a lot of us will probably die but some might have some other ideas and mm -hmm. then we can go off planet is another option but then yeah. there's also this other thing of a separation of reality so we're yeah. We're in our, our our planet, right? We're on a planet, but yep. we're in a context of existence. And so there's these bubble realities, too, that are happening where we yeah. don't necessarily leave the planet, but there is a shift dimension and, you know, all sorts of different things that can happen. Trust yeah. me that this has been going on for hundreds of thousands of years that they've had yes. to try to protect us, you know, yeah. in the Council of Five and, and uh, the ACIO. Like I said, the ACIO that you have seen um, through your grandfather is like number 15 or the, the uh, 15th division and so forth, mm -hmm. which is, an, it's the eight, the 12th division is not below that. I know that it might it look like it uh, numerically, but it's not. Um, <clears throat> there's a much, so if you have the 15th division over here, it's like say a bubble, right? the uh, the rest of the ACIO is like this you know it's much bigger okay. so we have um all these different divisions up to a, you know close to a 650 almost 700 you wow. know of divisions that they've consolidated over thousands of years okay and so part of them will never fully react with interact with because they're the ones that work on the um the science of keeping our you know our planet in flow our movement and some of the uh, architecture of our construct or they're doing different things like that and many of them are not terrestrial beings per se but can be here at any time if they wanted to yeah. be yeah it's it's interesting we're talking about this in the way you, you described it there's a in the next chapter that we we're going to discuss today um, towards the end. Our grandfather talks kind of about this interdimensional existence and and, and the contacts. And I'll just read this this couple paragraphs here just to put in perspective what what he was saying. Um, he said, "If we think that a place such as Venus would be in, in, inhabitable, then what about other higher dimensional non physical realities we can call hierarchies of vibrations of light levels unfamiliar to us? These vibrations allow physical tangibility. It could be like." The vibrations observed in the light spectrum, ultraviolet at one end and infrared in the other, with other color frequencies in between. 
same spectrum of physical tangibility is found in the atom itself. This is true for the entire universe. We are familiar with the various physical tangibilities we know on Earth. However, there are invisible realities where extraterrestrial contact may be made. Many Earth cultures have been based on religions that contain reports of angels and invisible realities. Then he says, the knowledge of the universe is multidimensional, more than we can comprehend at present. We call this harmonics of light, the spectrums of many realities and the science of light technology through which the extraterrestrials move. We are now approaching the merging of these worlds with our own reality. So he kind of summarizes kind of what you were, what you were saying about the, the different dimensional levels and the extraterrestrial interaction with us that we're not even fully aware of that's happening in parallel. And you could say another another reality, another dimensional um, yeah. timeline, right? And, and those comments yeah. fully validate that he had an in interaction with the ACIO. Really? That the, the expanse of his knowledge, in my opinion, validate that he has been in touch with the ACIO. So I'll just I'll say that in a repeat so people understand that um, I, I personally know exactly what he's talking about. And a lot of people don't fully understand it. And there are people that have scaled in spirituality but they're not in also the other workings of um, uh, the understanding of the, the the deep state and and the knowledge of military and so forth. And so he's it's a combination, isn't it? So mm -hmm. it's not just like we have gurus and the, not that I'm objecting to that, but it, that's not the um, the area that we're necessarily focused on. But it's it's sort of we'll say we're the Atlant the Atlanteans of mm -hmm. our days right so it's a convergence of technology and spirituality exactly and so but there's still that group that wants to negate all of it and doesn't want any technology whatsoever to mm -hmm. bring us to this, say for example the lemurian state where everything is just etheric and higher consciousness and and that people don't want or need anything uh tangible yep. you know yeah. to some degree but a, i i think if we're going more into the um atlantean Era, if you call it that, right? Right. I just read. Uh, there's the again another topic, a series of books that's really good. This is the Radu Cinemar and the Transylvania Sunrise series of books. I think it's really eye opening. I'm reading a book called The Forgotten Genesis, and it goes. It's really describing the, the even the etheric plane versus the physical plane, and some of the history of some of these civilizations, like you mentioned, Lemuria or even Hyperborea, and even some of these mythical cities that are like the Shambhala that we think are, you know, they're made up or whatever, but they're just on another plane of existence. That's why some people say, oh, I've seen it. Of course, I've seen it. It's real. Some people say, you know, most people are like, no, because where's the proof? Well, the proof right. is in the etheric. So how do you get access to the etheric? You have to be on a certain spiritual level or path. And certain civilizations also did that and some may have just vanished out in thin air to us but that's because they were able to go to that other plane of existence so it gets very complicated but it all ties back to the vibration and, and the, the things that our grandfather was mentioning too yeah. well you know you can even go a step forward i mean it's over to the idea that like the anasazi disappeared mm -hmm. and how do you explain that and even the spiritual native americans the mines, could yeah. figure out yeah. what happened to them and the mines are the same thing yeah which is kind of maybe we can segue into this next chapter going beyond the military bases mm -hmm. and talking about um what is it the uh nope that's the wing makers approaching the millennial sh millennium shift is that what it is yeah that's it yeah and so you um he talks to this individual uh, why, why don't you share your your thoughts on it? Because I read through it, but I want you guys to. Yeah, so this is another long, like uh, basically a long uh, diary kind of like think that from Lord Desmond and Lord Desmond Leslie is the nephew of Sir Winston Churchill. And this is his interaction with George Adamski and his recollection of some of the conversations. Of course, they were good friends and they, they had a lot a lot of time together, but Desmond Leslie, Lord Desmond got really interested in all these topics. So he went and searched these libraries to look up Atlantis and Lemuria, even over a hundred years ago, probably when he, yeah, he, he especially probably had access. And when the actual physical books were still there with that, he could find 
and looked up the Mahabharata and the Vimanas from the ancient um, Hindu and India from Indian texts. Um, and that completely starts to explain the technology that they had and almost like the, the nuclear weapon type of technology and the flying vehicles like the Vimana that were basically like these UFO craft. But the, in, the, the Hindu culture had this, had, had tons of writings about this and, and made this as they were as the balance and is telling their own history. So that's just one a, thing with that technology that they had. I, you know, I had known about the, um, the atomic weapons and things like that. Um, the, the accounts of that, but uh, rereading this chapter, I never, I never realized this. They, this he, he mentions that there were things about ancient wars in India and some of weaponry they used. They were able to make three dimensional images of false, of a false army, like holograms. So yeah. this is like Project, I, project Blue Beam. Which is you know, pretty yeah. wild, right? Yeah. I was yeah. like underlining that part too. I was like, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. But so they, think about it. Well, they had nuclear weapons. Why? I mean, they're, yeah. they're, if you look at their society, they're at where we, we are at now, but even more advanced. And there are people that study this, that, that it's their culture. You know, I think it's best that for them to talk about their own culture because, you know, they're very, very careful and protective of the meaning of certain things the explanation and, and how it all happened. And yeah. I have had many interactions with people from India that, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk freely because I, I've, I've actually had um, discussions with the one they call Shiva. Yeah. Oh. I've had communication with him. He showed up in a very difficult time in my life. And, um, and I talked to my friend and I said, and when he talked to me and he went like this with his head, you know, cause they do that. You know, and they right. talk and they, they use their hat. It's different yeah. body language, different cultures have. We, as an Italians, we you know, use our hands or whatever. They they have that little, you know, th thing that they do with their head and like an acknowledgement, a smile. And I remember looking at him and I said to him, I said, I thought you were fake. Because <laughs> they, usually they have these beautiful like blue colors, like blue skin. And he's very colorful and he's got flowers and he's got this big... Um, a uh, cow next to him, which is his friend. He's got a snake wrapped around his neck. I was like, I didn't know what to expect from my my experience with him. And it was beautiful. It was very, very beautiful. But they talk about Shiva as the um, the creator destroyer. Yeah, right. Destroyer of my worlds. Yeah, but my understanding is in order to create, it's like it's like you have to dig up the ground to destroy everything just to start to to grow again. Mm -hmm. So that's how I interpret it rather than like he's into weaponry. Although some people believe that that it was that technology the the atomic the the atomic weapons that were prevalent that were there mm -hmm. at that time. And they have history. They have amazing history of all of this very advanced technology. They have spacecrafts called the Vimanas. Mm -hmm. And they're able to do all these amazing things. Yeah. And and so we see them as old and archaic and and not very interesting. And and uh, in, in, I guess India just India just had um, landed on the moon too recently. I guess. So yeah. you know, there's some excitement for them. Um, but well, you know, I mean, we're gonna <laughs> the space program is kind of like questionable, you know what I mean, how they do it. I believe that they, they can do all this stuff, but I think they also put on um, a, a facade, you know, like they did with the Stanley Kubrick and the whole uh, moon yeah. missions and all that stuff too. So I don't right. want everyone to go on, they're going to be on the chat going, no, it's all fake. <laughs> so just to be clear, yeah. you have to cover everything. But sorry, I got all excited because I love, I love the truths that they're finding through India or right. that – the Indian culture is sharing with us because it's their history. China too has a lot of hidden secrets that mm -hmm. they've not revealed to us, and um, they kind of pulled away from spirituality, going more towards a, a non-spiritual, uh, more like a um, communist kind of ruling. So religion is kind of discarded. Right. But cuts out probably a lot of their amazing knowledge. You know, because. Yeah. 
but those civilizations yeah. they've been here that knowledge has been here for a long time we forgot it and then we're waking up to it again but yeah. i think we forgot it because we were abusing it i like the i like the tie to india just the the history there and the fact that their their historical record goes back farther than i than i've ever heard of any other culture that's alive today talking about where they came from i mean all the yuga, yuga cycles and everything um that's amazing that they kept all that and they do they kept a great record of their history but the fact that they're so spiritual as a culture makes you wonder well why are they so spiritual and if they evolved to that level of spirituality what could they might have done in the past that maybe led them down that road because they saw what would happen if they go the other way um i don't know it just makes you wonder things like that and the, the all the pyramids and temples in india and in china too there's so many pyramids in china i think there's there's obviously that linkage of pyramids around the globe but these certain certain pop places and cultures that definitely used it and 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 it came i mean whatever story if you want to do the anunnaki story or whatever it is but there are certain civilizations or advanced et races that helped grow these civilizations from way back when and i don't think it was just one i know there's definitely more than one uh, yeah sure. well you know i mean even though one society is very evolved another society you know other societies aren't in the world but we have some kind of like thread or link to one another energetically and we're all impacting each other so for us to be in a war it doesn't make any sense because it's almost like a self-sabotage mm -hmm. you know in, in in any circumstance so that that's where it's, it's spiritual intelligence of people stepping back and say wait a minute this is um destroying us instead of that kernel like i'm going to destroy you and um oh i forget that when i drop that bomb it's going to affect me too <laughs> i mean it's just like it almost makes you not very aware and and not thinking properly when you're in that state of mind so mm -hmm. uh, people should should actually you know acknowledge and that's the part of evolution or a normal evolution of consciousness right. but yeah and so it, linking to ets or those in in the galaxy through the internet we are going to connect and there's going to be some weirdness happening yeah because they're yeah. different from the way we you know usually see our civilization in that you know some of that could be happening right now yeah yeah, yeah. the whole yeah this whole thing about the internet being the connection between other you know that this the new way of communicating even through other you know civilizations and whatever but it seems to be like one way or another yeah the disclosures happening and the the pathways of communication are being much are much easier than they used to be. Access to information is much easier, but of course we have to know how to filter that out. And we have to do that with our own discernment. And if we're not very spiritually evolved either, it becomes very difficult and we do get, we can easily be, you know, uh, misled and and convinced of one thing or another without using our own, our own you know, again, our own thoughts and our own feelings and does that feel right does that seem right does it sit well with me we have to constantly be able to you know maybe go to a quiet place or or to, to really say okay this this is right or this doesn't seem right and i i don't really trust that completely so yeah i don't know it's interesting we're at that crossroads now like you said i think we could be going to where even actually i was going to bring this up uh the philip k dick that i just sent you that link to that video but he basically is describing that whole fact that we could be going to like a bifurcation or uh, another reality for those that are able to see it or go to that maybe like the etheric level of existence compared to just uh, more of the material side. But I think he was kind of trying to describe that and that they would be sitting there one in the same, where it's still the same present time, but completely different worlds depending who you who you are, I guess. Yeah. yeah, he was he was way ahead of his time and, and you had uh, a whole society full of logical thinkers, which is there's nothing wrong with the logical thinker. But, you know, if you can't touch it, feel it, eat it, whatever, you know, you can't use any of your real senses actually to, to grasp onto it, then it doesn't exist. And, uh, you know, it's a struggle. And he he did the best that he could to. And, and I think he was successful for the most part. 
Um, they probably had him on the fringe, you know, like uh, this guy's a little bit out there. But then you're you're starting to see, like Peter said, you know, the um, minority report is is right now. It's right now. They're doing that already. Mm-hmm. So um, he he's brilliant. I I I love his work. Uh, I loved all the, the movies that they came out about him. But I he was definitely here to awaken everyone. And Peter says that he works with the the ACIO. So we've had few discussions about him but yeah maybe that'll come another day <laughs> yeah great great and i like the ties that we can do with peter and his information with what our grandfather said um interesting when my grandfather listed all those underground bases that you know phil schneider mentioned 129 well the first one he's like here's to name a few but the first one he put is uh pine gap australia i thought that was interesting <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't know, and I don't know when Peter says he's in Australia. I assume he's he's dealing somewhere uh, with it. Probably has a link to that somehow. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely he's he's told me many times that he's a Pine Gap, and he doesn't hide it. Um, yeah. Although right now he's not there, to my knowledge. And I've had people say, well, yeah, you know, if I go there or I can remote view there and all this other stuff, and I'm like, well, good luck, because it's ever changing. You know, there's a, there's so much activity there that people think that they can, you know, like just show up there and try something, you know. But there's also it's a military base on top, uh, okay. you know, but he goes underground. Yeah. So so in, in your opinion, just real quick, I think we touched on most of the chapters. But so is Peter uh, in is he is, does he come back to our timeline or reality or is he kind of, do you think he's always kind of working from another reality in a way or timeline if if you of the i don't know i have 40 or 50 or maybe more interviews with peter <clears throat> there was one time where he went into a reality he'll go into these realities it was one time he was he was calling me from the reality and he was so uh distraught he was so distraught he was trying to find the right words he's like i think everyone's dying i'm seeing everyone dying so he, he like it's almost like he goes to a pinnacle or uh, for a lack of a better word, like a, like he's, he's at some location and he's observing what's happening. And it's almost like step looking into the future of what's happening and then coming back. Wow. Okay. So maybe it's not um, exactly future. So mm-hmm. that there's, who was I? I I think it was Phil K. Dick talked about how there's the octagonal way of doing things. So we look at everything linear, right? right? And he's like saying, well, there's so many different ways to look at it. So if you get a parallel, there's I could I could explain all the there's different ways that I can see too. So I can look into, and I'll know like oh that's over here or that's linear or that's in the past or something right. weird happened or anomaly or. So um, what I see is that, like there was these uh, like Peter will go to another uh, parallel of some sort, right? Mm-hmm. And then in that parallel, they're already f- more um, moving forward. Okay. So he can take a glimpse of that, and then there's realities that he's gone into where he says, "Well, you know, we could have had." this scenario where it's he calls it like the metro reality where it's a complete nuclear battle of some sort everyone goes underground the people start to um adapt a bit but they have to live underground they come up above you know with protections so you have that kind of thing and then at one point he's he named like three different realities all rolled into one he said you can't go above ground you immediately go crazy they messed with the electromagnetic field there's some kind of frequency going on, so immediately the the, the tone and the um, the effect or the damage to the context of existence mm-hmm. literally will make you go crazy if you went above ground. So they had to stay below ground the whole time. I mean, his details wow. of wow. of everything that he's experiencing. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent. I was just kind of curious on that, but yeah. I just. Thought- I thought I'd just, I think, Dan, if you remember, I just, I remember just, I just remember the last part of the, the, uh, about the George Adamski and kind of that. He does have a lot about that. And the one thing that's interesting to note is the, 
the medallion, the gold or the medal that he got from the Pope. And it was like very, uh, I think it, he was saying that, I think Desmond Leslie was trying to prove, well, is this true or is this not? How could that be? He, he didn't believe it, but he got confirmation by going to somebody else and asking them, you know, where, how, where could you find this metal? And, and the guy that knows very well about these collectible type things or some of that, uh, specifically, he said, there's no way you get that unless you're, you know, the Pope and <laughs> you have to be a very special person to get that. So there are some of these proofs that Adamski did meet the Pope. It was a special meeting that the Pope knew he, the Pope wanted to meet because he knew there was some message that needed to come and it was an extraterrestrial message uh, from the ET race. So I think the Pope and the Vatican, they've known about this stuff for a long time. Um, I'm sure there's, there's, there's these messages and interactions that have been going on forever. So that's just an important thing to note as far as, uh, as far as, you know, what their involvement is, whether it's completely malicious or not. I think the Vatican's holding a lot of information that they shouldn't be, but, uh, and maybe waiting for the right time to get it out. And they probably want to be looked at on the right side <laughs> of, of the story. But uh, it's interesting to note that he, he did meet the Pope and got that. And like you said, that he was buried in the um, <clears throat> in the U.S. Uh, what Arlington Cemetery, right next to John F. Kennedy. So, you know, why would Adamski have the privilege to do that? And you know, Kennedy yeah, knew. So yeah, Adamski, he he was, he had a lot of credibility apparently. You know, like like he's not even a U.S. citizen. He was buried in uh, the Arlington National Cemetery. Um, he spoke um, in front of. Uh, different committees uh, in, in the United Nations and different things like that. So he was apparently well respected. But what he was talking about is basically his encounters with UFOs in the early 50s. He was uh, taken aboard a mothership, he claims, and he was given this sealed package that he never opened. And that's uh, supposedly what he delivered to the Pope. And when he met with the Pope, the Pope, I guess they recognized each other right away and they went in and had their meeting and he never um, he gave it to the Pope. The Pope was like really pleased with it. He gave him that gold medallion in return. Um, and I don't think he ever found out what was inside the package. He never opened it, but he apparently had ongoing interactions and communications with this extraterrestrial group um, back in the early 50s. So it's a really, really odd story of, you know, why this guy was, you know, in these these higher distinguished circles, you know, coming forward with this type of information back then. and what the significance of that meant to the Vatican or, you know, the other higher, higher, high level government officials. So I don't know. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Yeah. There's also, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. <clears throat> there's, uh, there's also the issue about the belly button, like Valiant Thor. Right. Oh, right. The, the crazy belly button thing. Yeah. So yeah, he said uh, he, he didn't have a belly button, uh, George, George Adamski, and it was um, like a star that was, um, Deep, deep carved cut. into it's like an incision that was really deep into his his abdomen and he said he claims that um he when he was little he was taken away uh when he was like four years old and when he came back that's what he had instead of a belly button and he was like never the same person again so yeah his parents said that he disappeared at four and when he came back he was a different person <laughs> that's all yeah he was yeah known. there's some man took him i think it said right is it am i right yeah, somebody that took them, yeah. which like who was that guy? Right, right. And and also the the train experience there was just right before that he mentions the tr where Leslie uh, was going to the train with him to uh, the Damsky to meet some man and I guess that he stepped on the train with the Damsky to see this man and they sat together uh but the the guy was had had dark shades on and had really strange skin so it, it's it orange. was basically yeah, orange skin. So like, it's like this guy isn't completely human. But anyway, I think that was just a weird encounter. And then he didn't he didn't stay on the train, but there was an interesting conversation they must have been having or something. So that uh, was funny because they said that about Trump, that Trump had orange skin. Do you remember that? <laughs> Which, yeah. uh, Trump, is, Trump is not human, in my opinion, mm. or as we define human. Yeah, yeah. Maybe so, so, maybe but, so. Yeah, yeah and but then, and, and the, the well, one last part of that chapter um, that our grandfather was talking about um, here, I kind of discussed the end where he's talking about the different interdimensional stuff. Um, but one point I think he wanted to make when he was talking about, you know, 
George Adamski talking to President Kennedy. Um, he also included a, a letter in here from, from Robert Kennedy um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. from 1968, where Robert Kennedy was writing to this um, magazine, this publisher, Saucer News, um, talking about how interested he was. He's a card carrying member of the Amalgamated Flying Saucer Association. So he's like really into UFOs and he's talking about how the information that these guys publish is going to be really significant for bringing forward. Um, you know, new information on on the interdimensional phenomena and, and things like that, and extraterrestrials, and how important he thought that was to bring that to the public. So that's something I didn't I never I didn't recognize that the first time I read the book either. But um, yeah, Robert Kennedy. So it's pretty interesting that the tie there and the the want to disclose information. And I'm sure he knew a lot from his brother as well um, about yeah. all this stuff. You know, and um, yeah, I think another one of the reasons uh -huh. yeah there that's probably Boston Globe. So yeah, I mean there there was definitely an intro. I mean they're Bostonians, the the Kennedy family. But the uh, that's another reason I'm sure the two brothers were also killed. Not I mean Kennedy. There's a lot of reasons for JFK where his eventually he was assassinated. But the UFO topic there, their interest there didn't probably help too much. And for and the fact that JFK was so close to Forrestal and probably got a lot of intel from him that piqued his interest in. Who knows how much, but Borstal being the the one that was basically killed off and was the original MJ-12, one of the members that and then eventually got killed off because he wanted to expose what was going on. So, yeah, there's a lot of history there, and that, that's just an interesting tie. But I think that's interesting, too, that now we have Robert F. Kennedy Jr. running for president. And um, I know, I know. To for, I think that I don't know. I think as far as disclosure goes, he would probably be the one of the better choices. And I hope that you know nothing bad happens to him. I hope all the best and that he can, you know, keep 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 speaking up as much as he, he is. So it's good. Yeah. Yeah. I well, I I get concerned that the fact that he they they've obviously hit him pretty hard in that he has problems with his voice. I mean, he he literally, and and you know he's. The family has been intimidated quite a bit in the past, and whoever comes in office is going to have to be pretty strong, or else they're just part of the system and go along with everything. Right. Right. So. Right. Um, and who knows how much uh, he or Trump? They, maybe they both are being controlled in some levels, and maybe that always will be the case if you end up getting to be a president of the United States. But, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's some kind of. Um, you you kind of go into their construct. They they have like a little control system or a construct once you get involved in a way that uh, and there's so many other powers behind there. So for example, I mean, during the time of your grandfather, you didn't have BlackRock, you know, and yeah. you know you and all of these um, other uh, fringe groups like you know we talk about the shadow group as being one, but it kind of like these military agencies that have become independent and they're private now. So you have, you know, big government, you have multi-governments, you have um, then the, these fringe groups uh, that have lots of money. I mean, just look at even, uh, we they started having uh, candidates talk about the presidency and where do they go? They go to Twitter with Elon Musk to talk about it. So, I mean, these are high powered individuals, you know, those that run social media have a say, they're influencing um, news, the news media, they're influencing, there's people in the background that are multi-billionaires through Bitcoin that are influencing things. So you have so many hands involved in this right now that it's, uh, it's, it's messy. It's, it's really messy. There's, there's um, a loss of control, and and I think that's prevalent. What's happening, and so it's something's going to shake it up. I think. Yeah. And yeah. we'll we'll see what happens. Um, Peter, you know, I usually keep an eye on Peter because Peter seems to be a couple steps ahead of us in what's happening. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at, you know, when I first started talking to him, it was sometimes things would happen within six months sometimes two years i always said there's a two-year rule with peter so he'll say something that's completely off the hook he talked about the whole pandemic um told me yeah. the whole world would be shut down six months in advance 
and he knew all about it. But there's a lot of other things, too, that we've been trying to share with people. Like when people first heard it, they were like, oh, that's just crazy. Kind of like the um, the uh, the graphene uh, oxide and, and the, the, the femtotech and then, you know, kind of the <clears throat> the implants, the tiny little implants and stuff. He was talking about that year a couple of years ago. Yeah. Before anyone even thought, oh, that's just all right. That's really like sci fi or whatever. No, it actually happened. So, um, hey, you know, and and your your grandfather's insights are right up there. You know, he clearly wrote what he was supposed to write about, and and to present the information that was necessary at this time period. I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about right now. I think so, and I, I think, I, well, we just did a, that. I will save all the rest for later. The, the last chapter is going to be a great, you know, way to close out this whole series that we've done, and thanks again for having us do this. But the last chapter of the Wingmakers is, I've always said a, another can of worms, like a, a, rabbit hole, a rabbit hole to go down. But I, I did find this document, and I just, we just did the episode on that. Um, of the first part anyway that shows what was in that document in that prediction from 2023 so I think it does all very relevant uh, I think there's a reason he left the wingmakers for the end and they ate mentioning the ACIO in the end um, the one thing we didn't say I, he does mention the DCCCD which is the development of contact conscious contact citizenry department yeah yeah. I think we've asked I've, we've asked Peter about this because I haven't heard it anywhere else ever mentioned, but our grandfather said it was part of the NRO and it, it sounds like something nice, but the way he mentions it, he says it was actually to to get people to get people stirred up about the UFO as a UFO threat and they were intentionally, you know, having these sightings and whether usually from the government or whatever back engineered technology to show hey, there's stuff out here flying around, but to get people, you know, aware of it, and then they can use that to their advantage to use it as, okay, now there's some threat or there's something that we need to, you know, defend ourselves against. So it was interesting how he put it in there. And he kind of just put it in there real fast and was like, by the way, this is, this is also part of the NRO and I know about it. <laughs> so, well, he yeah. gave you, gave you all the tools that you needed for right now. And it's almost like they have an insight. They knew probably that you were going to take up the the cause and and start sharing with the public the things that you know. And as you're researching and validating some of the things that you you know you weren't there firsthand. So and even though you love and trust your grandfather, I appreciate that you've been objective. You want to make sure the correct information was out there. And I would feel the same way. I I you know I'm not you know blindly walking into anything either. You know, I want to have um, a strong sense of knowing when you're moving forward. So, and, and at some point, Peter, um, we we did actually an interview a while back and talked about he went through all the different chambers and it was very, very interesting. Exactly. Um, yeah. His knowledge on it. And yeah. that's what we plan to put out. We do, we do have that ready to go here. Uh, we're going to start releasing that too. I think that's really crucial to this time, especially to put out. So, yeah. Yeah, we'll be able to share that with the public, and I'm really excited about it. I know people have questioned us quite a bit because of um, the label of ACIO and being associated with the ACIO. And Peter talked about the 12th Division, uh, particularly because even though I'm in the 6th Division, I work with the 12th Division as well to um, help um, get the information out But uh, the, and in other areas as well. But uh, you also have started your new sh a new show. We talked about did we talk about that early on? I think we did. I didn't think it was right. Maybe not recorded though, but yeah. Maybe not recorded. Okay, so yeah. So tell us a little bit about your YouTube show because you've been on, um, you know, Infinity. Is it Infinite? No. Infinite. Infinite. Infinite sorry, Infinite um, TV. TV. So why don't you tell us about it, and so people know where to find you. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we're um, usually our show Shred the Veil is on Infinite TV, and we still have a, a library of episodes on there, um, but they're getting to, ready to relaunch some things, and so we ha haven't put any content on there in a while um, while they're doing this big relaunch of their website uh, and their platform. So in the meantime, we've started um, 
our own YouTube channel. It's called Clear Thought, C C L R Thought, or um, Critical Logical Rational Thinking, where it's just kind of our mission to expose people to information and let them discern it on their own. And that's a lot of what we talk about in a lot of our episodes is how you discern information and how you um, come to your own truths and using logical, critical thinking, but also, you know, using your intuition and uh, having that mix and, and looking at things from a removed perspective um, to try to get that understanding of what may or may not be true. So that's we're, we're starting to do a lot of videos there. And the first thing we've been talking about is, um, you know, Wingmaker stuff, the document that Derek was talking about. Um, and just, uh, you know, other things from previous episodes that we've done on Infinite TV with Shred the Veil, um, a lot of interesting topics that we've come over, over there that people may not have seen before. So we want to just expose people to all the all the stuff that we've been talking about the last couple of years and, and get them up to speed. And, you know, we also have people on the channel occasionally and talk about current events of what's going on in this school your community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I just want to stress that, yeah, you use your own discernment with everything. I was going to say I, we were going to put some of the episode that we did specifically on JFK, and I think it's good timing because of the 60th anniversary of his assassination. But um, it's that one's a hard one to swallow because it was my personal experience, and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. People can take it or leave it, but there's some information that came out, and I felt it was worth sharing. And uh, you know, and again, I'll leave it up to the audience to decide what they get out of it. But uh, I'm looking forward to helping uh, or at least sharing some more of that as well. I think, you know, for someone that that is, uh, I've been sharing for many years, my insights and things that I see. And as an interdimensional seer, and obviously I've been working with many people for, you know, I don't know, 25, almost 30 years now. And so um, it's hard because you're putting out some of your own personal information and of course, you're not there to like force it on anyone, but you're sharing some, some information that you have on a personal level. And what's I have discovered over the years, which I thought immediately it would be rejected, but it really wasn't. If, as a matter of fact, some people remember it. They remember some of these uh, different things that I've brought up and and you know have for them themselves validated it and then of course there's going to be some people that have another variation of it and say hey wait, wait a minute but i saw this and this and then i've looked at it a couple times and i said well maybe we're both right it's just that you were over here when that happened or you were at, at this time period when it happened i was somewhere else but maybe it all kind of was the same so it's it's the the um delineation between all right, this is something that we know for sure. We have the document, this happened in, in, with the government and so forth. And then you have, but this is something else that I'm adding to it. And you tell me if you see any validation in it. So it's not to push anything, but to open up and expand. And sometimes even if they don't remember or know anything, it triggers something else for them. Right. Which is the key point is, awaken awaken people yeah. help them bring back their memories and their recall and uh that will help then you know further because if you awaken then you remember what the lesson was what you learned from it yeah definitely which is the bigger issue so that the galactics are supporting this so that as we awaken we remember then we know not what to do or what to what we should be doing you know yeah. And the more we share our crazy experiences that seem out there, the more it will probably, like you say, it'll likely trigger in other people. Oh, wait, there's this thing that I kind of, I know it happened. I know there's something that happened. I just got to put the pieces back together. Like they probably block it out and uh, hopefully it helps, helps that. I think we all have to help put the big, all the pieces of the puzzle together and by speaking out and so sharing our stories, it hopefully does that. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And and also it helps, you know, create a more cohesive group because then people have some really piece, really important pieces of information and they're holding back because they're, you know, reluctant that they won't be accepted. And we need to be more welcoming to some of these different ideas. Exactly. Um, you know, like people have talked about like these off world um, prisons and so forth. It wasn't easy for them to come out and talk about these things. 
you mm -hmm. know, early on, but they did and they stuck it out and, and then other people started to realize, yeah, you know what, I, I think you're right because I had a dream of this or something else happens. But um, anyhow, uh, I, I'm probably the biggest person with going off on a tangent. I don't <laughs> mean but I think it's a good message, you know, the the awareness that brings brings on the awakening. And I think our grandfather was very much aligned with that of waking, waking people up to this stuff. Uh, and I know that was the mission at the end of his life. Um, and just to, to tie back into to the book on this uh, kind of end note that we're talking about here, um, and I'm just going to read one little thing about the Black Projects and kind of his message around that. Um, he says, there are projects within projects within projects, bioweaponry, bioweaponry, genetic engineering, cloning and implant technology, intelligence controlled medical facilities, genetic population control, mind control, remote engineering, remote technology intelligence, sonic weapons, beam weapons, plasma weapons, and so on. He says, it is only through public demand that the veil of secrecy can be lifted. The entire subject of UFOs should be open to a, th a thorough study with public involvement. The Black Project should be viewed as an identifiable misuse of our Constitution and our Bill of Rights of we the people and by the people. It's not time to be fair. It, it's not a time to be fearful, but time to be bold. So uh, I, and I think that was really kind of note that he went out on was it's time to be bold it's time to step up and it's time to have the you know sh share the share the experiences and the stories and, and have people be able to relate to them and it might be uncomfortable but you know this is this is <laughs> if we don't act now or do something about it or, or start to inform people and and help this awakening happen um we might be on a, on a timeline that doesn't have such a bright future yeah, I was actually going to share that quote too. It was a great way to end it. So he must be talking to us or <laughs> trying to get through right now. <laughs> yeah, this opens the doorway. You have three people talking about something. That's what I've heard. I, I think it was a fantastic conversation. And as usual, you guys are really wonderful guests. I appreciate you being here. Um, I appreciate your legacy and what you contributed to um, awakening people and, and informing in disclosing information and so like i said here's here's the the legacy is right here um uh, also the fond memories of your grandfather we appreciate what he did and um and also uh phil schneider and we can give a little tribute to him as well and the many others that kind of put themselves in the line uh stanford friedman i think was another that kind of compromised uh got you know left before his time probably but anyhow, um, thank you again for being on the show. And uh, until next time, we're going to cover the Wingmakers. And we're going to see if we can get Peter, the insider, to come in and share some of his information. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Jessica. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's listening. We appreciate you. And we're going to continue to bring in information. And uh, thank you for being uh, kind to our guests and supporting everybody. Until then, uh, until next time, have a good day. Okay, so a while back I did an interview with Derek and Daniel, and they invited me to be on their show and asked me if I want to talk about some of my recall past life related to the Vildaman and Third Reich experience. And so I did, but I never was able to share it with the public uh, because uh, I think I was having trouble just accessing and as they've been doing some work on the site, that uh, that's what happened. And you can see this is their homepage. You get to this page. And then if you want to check it out, you go. There's some other interviews on here that they've done. But uh, the one that I did is right here. The ACIO interview, the Nazi occult in the Fourth Reich. And play. And so you could see. Let me ask you this. Bringing this stuff quickly and, and, and without going into it, I encourage you to watch the whole thing. It was a um, very pleasant experience. It's nice to have people who are listening and watching and uh, want to hear some of the other experiences that we've had. So um, thank you for listening. And, and we are looking forward to that last segment regarding the book. So stay tuned. You have been listening to Androna Talks Radio. 
Join us on YouTube channel Jessica Errol Morocco and visit her website at www.readingsbyariel.com.